Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this installation of the Dimash Rambasad seminar series held by the Department of Economics. I am Dr. Reagan Devnanan, lecturer in the Department of Economics, and today we will be addressing the theme, Foreign Exchange Challenges in Trinidad and Tobago, What are the Real Implications? I'm very happy to be here with you all, and on the behalf of the department, we bring you greetings. Uh, we have three presenters who are experts at this field with us today. Um, and they will be sharing their thoughts around three themes. I'll discuss the three themes with you in a second, but let me tell you a bit more about the presenters that we have today. We have Dr. Terence Farrell uh, with us, who is currently a director of Republic Financial Holdings, Tattel and Tattel Life, as well as several private companies. He has served on government appointed committees addressing various public policy issues, including the Vision 2020 core group. Uh, over the past 30 years, he has served as director of various statehood companies, organizations, statehood agencies, uh, and most recently, Economic Development Board. So he's no stranger to the department. Uh, we welcome Dr. Farrell with us this morning. Our next uh, panelist, I shouldn't say next because the three will be speaking with you in different times, uh, is Dr. Ronald Ramkisun. And Dr. Ramkisun is currently the chairman of the Fair Trading Commission and a 2014 distinguished alumni of the University of the West Indies Alumni Association. He's a member, he was a member of the Economic Development Board. He has written, published in several areas um, dealing with monetary issues. Um, and he, again, no stranger to engaging with us in the department. So welcome, Dr. Ramkisun. Our you, third Ram. panelist, and by, so, by no means least, we have Dr. Dave C. Ratton, who is a lecturer in international relations. Uh, he has researched and published in areas such as financial innovation, financial regulation, financial markets in the Caribbean, fiscal reforms. He now teaches international uh, money and finance at the graduate level at the Institute of International Relations. And um, formerly, he was he headed the Caribbean Center for Money and Finance um, over several years. So we have some very experienced, very distinguished um, family members, I should say, to the department, and we are pleased um, to have them with us this morning. We have three themes that we will be uh, we were, that we will be discussing and centering our discussion around today, and uh, the first is really where we are in terms of foreign exchange availability policies and the discussion thereof. The second is the realities: what is going on? What are the economic impacts that we see happening right now? And the third is, is the possible way forward: what are the different policy paths, and how do we? Um, what are the considerations moving forward? So today's session will be a discussion around these three themes, and um, we look forward to your questions. Feel free, as audience members, to post your questions uh, on the group. Uh, we will be taking those questions and addressing those questions at the end, but you can feel free during the session to put those questions on there so that we can field it at the end, All right? So I want to get straight to the panelists. These are our main feature, and I want to go to the first theme uh, and I'm going to start to ask Dr. Siratan to start off here. Where are we in terms of foreign exchange availability? What is the situation? Uh, his thoughts on that. Dr. Siratan, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a pleasant good um, morning to everyone participating in the seminar. I want to thank the Department of Economics for inviting me to speak on this very important issue. Um, the, this issue has been playing out in the press for a very long time, even before the pandemic. So it's something that is a structural problem that we face over different political administration. And um, it is one of the main uh, factors bedeviling our um, economic development. Um, on this first um, segment, I'm going to be very summary um, because I think a lot of the issues in terms of the factors which has brought us to this point have been well ventilated in the press. Um, but um, it bears repeating because sometimes, as the panelists pointed out, um, the public is not always okura or, or, or um, knowledgeable about some of these areas. So one of the first thing I think you need to, to mention when you're talking about foreign exchange problems in small open developing countries is essentially the structure of the economy and our, in particular our dependence, high dependence on the, um, the energy sector. Um, and as you know, those economies so um, structured um, have particular features, one of which is huge swings in economic performance 
based on what is happening in commodity markets. And all of us who have been following commodity markets over the years knows that something called the commodity super, super cycle ended in basically 2014 and commodity price have been depressed be, um, ever since. Um, it has gone up, it has fluctuated um, a little bit, but it has not gone back to the levels we saw before, before um, 2014. So that's one. And of course, once you are not earning sufficient foreign exchange based on what is happening to commodity price and commodity markets, then of course your supply of foreign exchange in the local market is going to be compromised. And that has been, of course, one of the main challenges and one of the main factors that has, um, has brought us to this point. So that is one of the, fun what we economists like to call, term fundamentals. And of course, there are some policy issues surrounding that particular issue in terms of how we manage our affairs that has um, been important in terms of, of um, accelerating and, 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 uh, and making the problem even deeper. So for example, um, for many years, we, although the authorities say that we have a flexible exchange rate regime system, de facto, we have basically a fixed exchange rate system because if you have looked at the exchange rates and that has been um, published over time, um, by the central banks and so on, um, particularly before um, 2015, 20, um, you will see that uh, in some cases, the, the rate seldom moved. And every morning I get up, I could, go to, um, I could go to the websites of the various commercial banks and I will know essentially what the rate is likely to be, right? So, um, so that the way in which we operated as a fixed exchange rate regime system also has, um, has contributed to how we got here because, as I said, when the commodity super cycle ended in 2014, most commodity producers in Latin America um, started to allow to allow the exchange rate to to to, to um to, to adjust some of the, the burden. So over time, the imbalances wasn't as high as they are in Trinidad and Tobago now because over time, some of these um, stresses would have been ameliorated by the changes in the exchange rate and. At that point in time, you have very small changes, so it's not overly um, um, problematic for the economy. Um, another factor that is important, of course, is the whole interest rate strategy, and the, in particular, the low interest rate strategy that most governments, um, um, many governments, sorry, um, follow in the in the belief that if you have a low interest rate, you're going to you're going to prime economic um, activity. But in, as economists know in the, in the region, the relationship between interest rates and economic activity is uh, at best a tenuous one. And last, but by no means least, is the whole issue of the microstructure of the foreign exchange market. Dr. Farrell, who is here with us, would have been around in the central bank when, as deputy governor, I believe, when the, our system was, was, was formulated in 19, back in 1993. And we are now in 2021, and there has, there has been little tweaks to the system, but we have not really fundamentally um, upgraded change, restructure the microstructure in the foreign exchange market. And some of those structures are, of course, outdated, but more importantly, it generates certain incentives, which I hope we'll talk about a little later down in the seminar. It generates certain incentives that predisposes um, the country to having these foreign types of foreign exchange problems. So I, I think I've exhausted my time, so I would stop here and I could probably handle any issues that participants may have in the question and answer session. Thanks. Right. Well, let me turn over to um, Dr. Farrell uh, for his thoughts on this theme. Thanks very much, um, Reagan, and good morning to everybody. It's actually afternoon where I am. Uh, the, 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 I just want to agree uh, immediately with um, with Viv's uh, diagnostic, that is that the problems we are facing now have the fundamental roots in what has happened in the energy sector. Uh, he, he calls it the energy super cycle. It is, that's absolutely correct. The commodity cycle that we have in respect of things like oil and gas um, are, very, are very long. Um, just, just to point out that if you, if you, for example, if you looked at a series in respect of real oil prices, that is to say you, you, you deflated oil prices by the, by the United States Consumer Price Index, when oil prices fell in 1982, they did not get back to the level of 1982 in real terms until 2007. That's a long cycle. 
And, and so prices began to rise from 2007 up to 2014. And then since then, we have seen prices of oil and of natural gas coming down. And it is that that has precipitated the situation that we are currently in. I just want to point out that one of the things that makes this uh, aspect of the cycle, this, this downward phase of the cycle, very, um, but I, I think different, it is that because we are seeing what people are now describing as the energy transition, that is to say countries are accepting that the, the, there's an end to fossil fuels, oil and crude oil particularly, uh, natural gas later on, a shift to renewables uh, uh, and so on, that this cycle, this down phase of the cycle is going to be much longer uh, and it is going to be in fact terminal as far as crude oil and natural gas is concerned. So if we are looking somewhere in the near future for some kind of upswing in respect of oil and gas prices, we will see bumps and we will see as we are seeing now prices going up a little bit and so on, but we are unlikely in my view to see prices getting back anywhere near in real terms to where they were 10 years ago, back to where they were in 1982. The other point that I would make um, before, before I turn over to Ronald is that, is that um, the, the, the balance of payments uh, deficit that results from the collapse in oil and gas prices from 2014-2015 then has an immediate knock-on effect on the fiscal side because a significant uh, part of government revenues comes from the energy sector and, and that then precipitated government fiscal deficits uh, which then causes the economy to, to slow down. Uh, so we are seeing, if we want to look at some of the numbers that we are seeing, we are seeing that the demand for foreign exchange is in fact falling, which is what we would expect to happen as the economy has been contracting. So the demand for foreign exchange is falling. But unfortunately, the supply of foreign exchange into the market is, has been falling faster than demand has been falling. And as a result of that, our foreign exchange reserves have been declining. And that has put us into the situation which has precipitated the responses from government, uh, as Deva said, uh, attempting to, to, to fix the exchange rate, which has then led to a situation of what I call rationing of foreign exchange at this time. Dr. Rampisivan. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dave Unanan, and uh, good morning to, to viewers and my fellow panelists. Uh, much has been said in a short period of time by my colleagues, which speaks to uh, what, what is the situation now, and in fact, uh, a bit as to how, what has brought us to this point. Um, I, I, I want to make the point that it is useful to distinguish between the factors which are global, and that has to do with the global price of oil, the fall in the demand for oil and natural gas, and so forth. So there's a global economy impacting us. And then there is the domestic side. In other words, we understand that we live in a mineral-based economy, and we understand that we live in a democratic country. So that understanding then says, well, what do we do about it? What have we done since in this first take on the topic, uh, we are dealing with what are the real implications? I think it is very useful to see uh, to, to examine what we have done about the place we live in, in respect of the policies that we have been putting in place for a long time. How we have been acting, reacting, not reacting, and that we are where we are today because we made certain choices in respect of the exogenous factors, 
the global developments, and then what we did in respect of those factors. I think it is important to, to understand that we are making, have made choices that have landed us up in the position that we are in. And therefore, if we, if we recognize that we have made certain choices in response to the external environment, we have to ask, have we made the right choices? And how should we refashion, reshape these choices? What new choices should we make going forward? I would stop there. Okay, thank you. So some very important points in terms of why we are here, um, some history there as well. Uh, and we also have more questions to ask ourselves as we go forward. But I would like to go on to the second theme um, now, and we can always save those for the question and answer part. Where are we now? Uh, in the, what are the realities? We're looking at the implications, the economic impact, are they the same policy measures? And I'd like to turn over um, to you all to address that second theme, the impact, uh, as you see it right now. Let me start with Dr. Farrell. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Regan. Um, well, so, so in terms of just, the, just the, the numbers that we are looking at, if we, if we look at what, what has happened to the demand for foreign exchange, uh, and the demand for foreign exchange, we can kind of track it by looking at the central bank's data on sale of foreign currency to the public by the commercial banks. Uh, because because most, most of the actors in the economy who get foreign exchange get it from the commercial banks. There are some actors in the economy who generate their own foreign exchange. And by, by law, because we, 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 we modified, we essentially gutted the Exchange Control Act in 1993, an actor who earns foreign exchange is by law allowed to keep it for themselves if they want to do whatever they want with it. What they, what they can't do is that they can't sell it to somebody else. If they want to sell that foreign exchange, they must sell it to an authorized dealer, which is to say a commercial bank. Uh, so the demand for foreign exchange in 2015, for example, sales of foreign currency to the public were about 7.4 billion US dollars in that year. In 2020, sales of foreign exchange to the public had come down to four and a half billion dollars. So there has been a three billion US dollar drop in sales of foreign exchange by the commercial banks to the public. Does that represent a fall in the demand for foreign exchange? The answer is yes, in part it does, because the economy has contracted over that period of time. The supply foreign exchange has contracted because we talked about what has happened with the energy sector. But the, the reality is that we know that there are some actors in the economy, there are some actors who are unable to get the foreign exchange that they need or to get it in a timely fashion. Uh, remember that since 1993, when we've had the managed float system, it was introduced then, there have always been queues for foreign exchange in the commercial banking system so that people did have to put in a request. You didn't get it particularly. Uh, in this situation, what we have is that because there is uh, rationing of foreign exchange by the commercial banks at the behest of the government, so the government has told the commercial banks, uh, you will exercise your discretion, you need to uh, give foreign exchange to manufacturers and so on and so forth, give less to other people, there is rationing that is taking place. Now, consequences, there have been several consequences that we've seen of what's been happening. Number one, a black market in foreign exchange has emerged. And the existence of the black market is an indicator that something is wrong in the market. Uh, before we had queues for foreign exchange, people queued up to get it, but they knew that they were going to get it. And therefore, there wasn't much of a, of a black market in foreign exchange prior to, say, 2016. Now there is a, 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 a black market for foreign exchange, which I understand is fairly active, and people are quoting different rates that are out there, 825, 850, and so on, for, for US dollar. 
the second thing that we do know in terms of the kind of, 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 of impacts that we are having, the sorting impacts that we are having, is that government, um, to the Minister of Finance, has indicated to the commercial banks that they need to give priority to certain kinds of demands. So that demands, for example, from manufacturers or demands for food and so on have been prioritized by the commercial banks. Now, what that has meant is that there are certain other demands for foreign exchange that are important in a modern economy that are not being met in a timely fashion, which begin to have other consequences. So, for example, in a sector which I am fairly familiar with, which is to say the insurance sector, the insurance companies have been having a lot of difficulty finding foreign exchange to make their reinsurance payments. So, for those know anything about the insurance industry, <clears throat> every, for every dollar of property insurance that you, that you spend, you, you put uh, pay insurance on your property, 75% uh, of that, 80% of that is in fact reinsured outside. So you've got to pay the reinsurance amount. And we're having some difficulty, insurance companies, in getting commercial banks to give uh, funds for reinsurance payments. Another area which I'm aware of, because people tell me some of these things, uh, has been the remittance of dividends. So there are foreign companies operating in Trinidad. Uh, they have the earned profits in Trinidad, and then they want to remit their dividends. They want to get foreign exchange, to remit their dividends back to their health care offices, and they're having inordinate difficulty because that uh, kind of foreign exchange remittance is deprioritized by the commercial banks on the instructions of the Ministry of Finance. Now, I just want to point out that what, what is significant here is that the existence of the black market uh, and, and the business people who are participating in this uh, black market for foreign exchange, the inability of certain businesses like insurance companies uh, and other companies who can't get money to, 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 to remit their dividends impacts confidence in the market, impacts confidence in the economy. The underlying thing about any monetary system, any financial system is confidence. So if you have a situation where your business community, uh, and in particular, the foreign players in your economy, who are those who are still there, have less confidence in uh, the system to be able to give them the foreign exchange when they need it, is something which is then going to impact us later on in terms of people's willingness to uh, make investments in the economy and so on. So mm -hmm. I think let, let me stop at this point and perhaps my, my fellow panelists will identify some other factors that they might want to highlight. We're examining the implications, the impact of the foreign exchange situation on the economy. Let me turn over to Dr. Rampistoon for his thoughts. Well, there are several impacts really in terms of the way in which we have operated the economy in the context of scarce foreign exchange and the strong, strong uh, import demand, but weak uh, uh, supply. So Terry mentioned a fair amount uh, in respect of what has turned out to be a rationing of effects of foreign exchange and the impact that has been having on businesses and so on. The fact is that import demand, although lower, still remains strong so that uh, various ministers, uh, the government has had to, from time to time, ask the population, don't don't spend so much on imported goods and services. And they have tried to encourage uh, through what we might call moral suasion, companies to export more and so on. So we have had that kind of a conversation, but the reality is that the incentives, the incentives to continue to import uh, are there the incentives in respect of the price of imports, uh, whether it is for whatever reason, 
the consumer, the business remains uh, essentially stagnant. And the net result uh, is in fact a reduction of foreign reserves. And we continue to see a decline year after year in the country's stock of foreign reserves, only supplemented, if you like, to foreign borrowing, which itself is then depleted as we go along. So we have a situation in which uh, the inflows are very slow. Uh, we continue to use up the foreign exchange in all kinds of things at an essentially fixed price. And we see that the, the, on the supply side, there are no real incentives from the price side to be able to expand other sectors. Uh, understanding very well that the world at this time is a very difficult place for exporters, given what is happening globally. But the question arises, should we not be attempting to transform this economy towards a greater supply of exports and a reduction of imports? I think that that, that is the kind of conversation we need to be having now as we begin to get over the, the, the COVID-19 effects, uh, as we note, uh, I think it is very positive that we have started today uh, on the vaccination program. In the interim, what have we been doing? We have been uh, supplementing whatever foreign exchange we, we earn at lower prices, lower output, in, uh, by, by increasing debt. And again, that is a very dangerous thing as we know, and as in fact, the Minister of, of, of Finance has alluded to in his February uh, media brief. So we are in a position then, the current impact is, is bringing great uh, challenges to policymakers, to businesses, to the average citizen. Uh, and therefore, we, we need to do something that will be able to take us out of this, uh, th this situation that we find ourselves in that we don't see on the horizon any possibility of, of strong energy price increases, neither in respect of production. And therefore, we, we need to move towards ensuring that as we come out of this situation, that we are moving into a new situation where we would be able to increase, to increase our earnings of foreign exchange as the global economy picks up and as it is predicted to pick up. And as we do certain kinds of activities we need to be careful they are not indeed increasing economic activity, but increasing ac economic activity along the lines of non-tradables. That is economic activities that are not going to earn us foreign exchange, but simply allow us to continue to use up foreign exchange in respect of some of the activities that we have been talking about and that we see as coming out of projects out of the, the various ministries. Dr. Suratan, the impacts on the economy, your thoughts, please. Yeah, yeah. Both Dr. Um, Farrell and Ramki have mentioned some of the, 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 um, the outcomes um, and some of the fallout from the problems we are experiencing. Um, I think most people will be familiar with the fact that our foreign exchange reserves dropped from about 11 billion, roughly 11 billion in 2015, to about 6.8 billion at the end of 2020. That's you, you're running through for an exchange in the last five years, about $4.2 billion. Um, as, as Dr. Ramkison mentioned, our foreign debt has escalated in a, to over 80% in a very short space of time. Um, so those are some of the risk factors that we face. And this is happening in the context where the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago is supporting the market um, I think I believe the the um, 2020 the central bank supported the local foreign exchange market to the tune of 1.2 billion dollars. So we are having all these problems in terms of shortages and so on. 
in the context of not only the support from the central bank in the, uh, um, in the amount of 1.2 billion, but also in the context of rationing by the, um, the, the, the commercial banks on the advice of the, the central banks and so on. So if those different things weren't uh, are in place, the support from the central banks on the rationing, one could imagine what the, um, the situation would be. So, um, so sometimes when you look at the current metrics, it doesn't really um, highlight the extent of the problem that we face, right? Um, so those are the macro kind of um, um, results or the outcomes that have, that have been generated by this problem that we have in the foreign exchange market. Um, but to put it in pers into perspective, um, especially among small and medium enterprises who have much greater um, challenges in terms of sourcing foreign exchange, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce actually um, commissioned us uh, a survey of their members recently, and they found that 83% of their members um, had significant problems sourcing foreign exchange. And most of them um, only were able to, 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 to garner about 50% of their request. Now, so you, you're having a situation where these enterprises are functioning with 50% of the requirement of FX that they will normally in normal business conditions be, um, be, 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 be using. And that has had, of course, very, very real effects on the population. So for example, uh, most of us would, would have seen recently where the commercial banks reduce the foreign exchange limit on credit cards from on the maximum level from 12, um, I think um, 12,000 US um, per cycle to 10,000. So that's one thing that most of us would have been affected by. But the, um, the enterprises who um, responded to the survey also indicated that the foreign exchange problems were having, was generating um, problems for purchasing raw materials. Um, they, they were unable to, to maintain some of the supply change because of the problems they, they had in terms of meeting their external obligations, their suppliers began imposing more stringent credit terms for suppliers. Um, which means that the, the cost of doing business went up. Um, and of course, a lot of businesses have had to reduce the range of products they offer as well as downsizing in some cases. So it has real implications, not only for, um, the, um, for business activity, but businessmen um, in terms of trying to meet their objectives and meet the needs of the clients, but as well as... Um, for example, unemployment, which has a knock-on effect on the rest of the economy. So this, the impacts, um, although we could, we, economists like love to talk about the, the, the global scenario and the, pic, the, the aggregate picture and so on, when you drill down to what is going on in terms of businessmen, especially small and medium enterprises, um, ordinary citizens who are, are going to purchase items from the supermarket and so on, you, this is having a knock-on effect on And for those who have not noticed Almost everything in the groceries now have, have, have gone up and, and the, the exchange rate supposed to still be at levels close to what we had before the pandemic. But the reality is in the market, as Dr. Farrell mentioned, people who are sourcing foreign exchange sometimes have to pay as much as 850 in order to get the, the foreign exchange that they need. So that is going to have a knock-on effect in terms of products and services that they offer to the market. So we are having some, and for some time have had been having a lot of real um, challenges uh, at the, in the business sector and in, um, among consumers, um, which um, is acting as a drag on economic growth. Not to mention the problem with the government in terms of not being able to, to, um, to spend as much as they used to before. And since the government is a major player in the economy in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, that has implications um, for the overall level of economic activity and the welfare of people who live in this country. So I'll stop there and probably some of the um, panelists could pick up on some of these things later on. Thank you. We have heard so far, you know, what's um, uh, really interesting among many things that you all have said, we've heard about how deeply entrenched these problems are when we talk about the genesis. And then we've been talking just now about the impact and how uh, differentiated it is, differentiated across different actors within the economy. Um, as well as how impactful, right? I'd like to turn this discussion now, um, I think to where we would all, we really need to spend some time, which is what happens next, uh, future possible paths. Can we leave things, should we leave things as they are? If we do, 
where might they end up? Uh, are there better ways? What should we be considering uh, in light of where we are and how deeply entrenched these issues are? How do we address these issues and how should we be moving forward? Let me turn over to Dr. Ram Kisun to start this last part of the discussion. Thank you very much, Regan. So we started with what we have been doing over the years, how we have been managing uh, the economy, this mineral-based economy in a democratic setting over the last decade, few decades. And we have come to the point and discussed, uh, where are we now? The global economy has unfolded. We have made certain choices domestically uh, and we are at a certain place. Uh, and we were in a certain place uh, before COVID, a place where uh, foreign exchange was being depleted, our reserves were being depleted, debt was rising, uh, unemployment growing, and a couple of these things happening uh, prior to COVID. Indeed, if COVID-19 has done anything, it is to make matters worse. And in, in many respects, one in respect of the kinds of increase in prices that we expected globally uh, in, in, in energy prices, and uh, it has also dealt a serious blow to our human resource, to our people, to people's health, to, to businesses, the, the ability to business, of businesses to keep running, uh, I guess. So the choices we made, and we made choices in respect of the exchange rate, which was more, to hold it more or less fixed, in the last in the last few years, and we have made choices as to what we do in respect of debt, and we have made choices in respect of foreign reserve, in, in respect of, of of the HSF, and so on. If we are looking at future growth in this economy, then there are certain questions which, in fact, were raised in the midst of COVID during the road to recovery by a particular team set up uh, by, by the prime minister, I think it was. And there were certain recommendations coming out of that. Those recommendations uh, had to or, or surrounded issues of resetting this economy because I think there was a broad recognition, uh, even by the authorities that we, it cannot be business as usual coming out of the, the, the recession, coming out of COVID-19, and therefore we have to do things differently. And that, that has been accepted. Uh, but I think it is very important to remind ourselves that we took certain measures but those measures by and large did not lead or did not put us on a different path. So therefore we have to revisit. We need to rethink, we need to reset the economy as we go forward. Initially, it is understandable that we have to get out of this situation. More people have to be vaccinated. People must be returned to work. The, the businesses must reopen and we have to gradually get out of this. But we must understand or we must seek to, as we get out of this, seek to transform the economy, which is a challenge, I accept. But there, there ought to be no other way because the other ways we have tried them and they were not giving us different answers. In respect of the exchange rate uh, and the subsidies which are inherent in having an exchange rate that is overvalued, we see some changes that are at least being discussed in respect of subsidies, in respect of holding prices 
constant nominal prices. And we see that the government has moved in respect of allowing certain commodities to reflect international prices, to reflect more competitive and efficient prices. And we see changes being made in fuel. We see changes being made in respect of electricity, changes in respect of water, uh, where essentially the government is arguing, well, we need to let these prices reflect what indeed they are costing us to produce. So arguably, the exchange rate is an even more important price. So I would ask, should we not consider allowing the exchange rate to be more competitive, to reflect what is actually happening in the domestic and the global economy? Uh, I think that that is where the rethinking and the resetting should be. Of course, economists are concerned with the social impact. I know some, some would argue that economists are not concerned with the social in, 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 in impact of policymaking. It is very far from the truth. But there are different ways in which we will address social issues. In many cases, we want to ensure that only those who need those benefits, those who need help, get help. And therefore, we need to look at the way in which we do social support. And we need to ensure that those who are, are, are poor do not, that the situation does not get worse for them. And we need to put things in place. And there are some things in place to ensure that that does not happen. So, so it is not simply a question of making businesses more competitive, making us more export oriented, but it is also looking after those who fall out of attempting to do that. I think retraining of citizens to be more, to be more uh, aligned to export sectors or import competing sectors, I think, I think has to be on the agenda as well. Uh, the issue of incentives, uh, the government has sought to provide incentives for exporters uh, in certain ways in various budget over the last little while, but I don't know that it has had the kind of impact that the government expected or hoped to get. Uh, and I'm talking to even before COVID. It is well established in the literature that if you get certain things right, including prices, then the incentives that you then have to give would be less. In fact, there might be no need for incentives. If we were to take something as simple as agriculture, if you uh, service the pumps if in, in, in areas that flood, if you prevent flooding, then you are unlikely to have to budget for farmers suffering from flooded fields and for the destruction of crops. In other words, you do the, the right thing, you do what is supposed to be done, and therefore you would then have to have less, a smaller part of your budget go towards uh, subsidies in such cases. I want to make uh, maybe the final point that communicating what you are doing, why you are doing it as a policymaker, as government, is critical and perhaps it's the most important thing that we need to do certain things, take certain measures that are going to be beneficial, if not in the short, in the long run. While you take care of some of the short run concerns, but that these policies, they are going to hurt, but we are going to make the necessary changes to the economy that are likely to give us a better result. Uh, we, we finally, we remind ourselves that getting the exchange rate right, getting the economics right, that is only part of the issue. And as an economist, I am not unaware that, that there are several other broader issues that, uh, that we need to address at the same time. I now pass it over to my other panelists. Dr. Siratan, we are talking about future paths. Uh, what can we do? Can we stay where we are? The choices that we're making, um, 
are there different choices that we can make and should be uh, discussing yeah well what is obvious is that we cannot stay where we are if we, it, there's a very definite outcome um that will happen to us if we stay where we are but i want to preface my comments in this section by mentioning three things three very important things um the first is that there's no magic bullet no one policy that, or even a variety of policies that are going to solve the problem because as i said this is the, the the manifestation of the foreign exchange problem it has structural um a political economy kind of um, um um factors underpinning it as well as social factors in terms of case patterns and so on right so these things cannot be solved by one particular policy or cannot be uh, or necessarily in a short piece of time so what you need basically is a mix of policies that must be consistent right what you have to understand as well as is is that there is no perfect nirvana where you're going to get a mix, particular mix of policies that's going to solve the problem and everybody's going to be happy. Inevitably, each policy has cost and, and impose collateral damage in certain sections of the society. And exchange rate policy change in particular has far reaching, even generational distributional impact, um, as, as Ronald was alluding to in his presentation. And thirdly, I think in terms of strategy, we have to think about timelines and durations and so on. So I always tell my students, for example, that you know there is the arithmetic of economics and the algebra of economics. The algebra of economics is much more complex because you have to factor in all kinds of uncertain factors and think about what the world is likely to be 10 years down the road before you formulate economic policy, right? And if you only, the, um, if you only look at the, the challenge that we face, um, from the vantage point of, of figures on the, on the surface, like an accountant, we're going to run into problems. Um, one of the most important strategic things I think we need to take into account is the whole issue that Dr. Farrell mentioned, which is the length of the commodity cycles that we face. And he mentioned that these commodity cycles, the super cycles, take very long. I would estimate that the cycle is about 10 to 12 years. So if we say that the super cycle, commodity super cycle ended in 2014, if it's 10 years, it's 2024. If it's 12, it's 2026. So you might see some resurgence or strengthening in the, um, in the commodity uh, markets around that time that could help us out. So what your strategy, your economic strategy has to be predicated on when you believe the energy, energy sector is going to start seeing some significant improvement and so on, right? Um, so in that context, I think that um, it's unlikely that we're going to see any significant uptick in the um, commodity markets um, anytime soon. And therefore we have to plan for the long haul. And in that context, I want to suggest certain things that we, we, we need to do. So for example, Ronald mentioned making the exchange rate more flexible as it was intended. The flexible exchange rate is meant to absorb some of these shocks that we face internationally. Um, and you cannot move the exchange rate up and down every time there's a price change in the commodity market, but you have to allow it to adjust um, um, little by little over time. So for example, in a previous um, presentation I made on the budget, I likened to managing the exchange rate as a ball rolling down the hill, but you had a string attached to it. So you could control the descent. And that is what the, the powers that we need to do. It's inevitable, given all that we have discussed, that the, that the rate will, will, will need to go down. The only difference it is whether we take it upon ourselves to manage that descent, or whether we, 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 we adapt the status quo and allow things to, um, to, um, to deteriorate to such a point where we have no option but to, uh, to seek international assistance, which will inevitably mean the rate is going to move, but we're going to have less control over how it goes down the hill, okay? So that's one. The other things, um, so we have to consider that the huge social costs that exchange rate changes impose, especially on the lower income segments of society. So we have to be mindful of that. I would have previously, eschewed adopting a more flexible attribute to the, to the exchange rate, primarily because of the social impact it was going to have, right? But I think we are at a point now, if we stand still, 
we're going to, the adjustment we're going to have to make is going to be much more costly and more painful, right? We have to deal with the world as it is, right? So in terms of that, more exchange rate flexibility, but with, with the government controlling the thing very, very carefully, because as economists will know, exchange rate can very, very quickly get out of hand because the exchange rate is determined not only by fundamentals, but expectation, behavioral factors, panics, and so on. So it is very, very difficult for policymakers, even if they have a war chest of uh, billions of dollars in reserve to control where the exchange rate is going to be. So the, the central bank has to be very careful. The government has to be very careful. And I suspect the reason why they have played a conservative and played defense most of the time by keeping the exchange rate fixed is because of that fear about what could potentially happen to the rate once we allow it to be much more flexible and so on. But in spite of the, um, the changes to the exchange rate, um, I, think, I think we need to revisit our interest rate strategy. So right now, on three-month treasury, the difference between three-month government security and three-month treasury is about 16 basis points, right? So you, you have to have a much wider um, spread between US government securities and TT dollar denominated securities because TT dollar denominated securities are by nature much more risky. So if you have a, a simple situation to illustrate the point is, if I have a foreign exchange deposit at the other commercial bank, I, again, less than 1%. If I have a, de, um, a deposit account in TT dollars, I'm probably getting around the same thing. So if you had to choose and you had foreign exchange, what would you do? Would you convert the TT dollars and put it in a TT um, dollar account or you leave it in the FX account, which incentivizes on an aggregate scale, incentivizes people to hold foreign exchange. Okay, so the interest rate strategy need to change. And this whole, this, this almost, this, this notion that low interest rate prime economic activity, I mean to say most economists, every economist with his salt in the Caribbean knows there's a, at best a very tenuous relationship between interest rate and economic activity, right? That particular relationship has no um, relevance or little or no relevance in Caribbean type economy. So we need to dispense with that particular thing. And um, we need to, Dr. Farrell would have been wrong when the cre creation of the foreign exchange market as we know it now came into being. But we have, we have a microstructure of the foreign exchange market that has been around for almost 30 years that we have really tweaked. We haven't made any fundamental changes. So whereas the fundamental factors are the major factors causing your foreign exchange challenges, at the margins, the efficiency of the micro market structure that we have now impacts on the ability of the market to efficiently deal with shortages, price changes, and so on and so forth. So we need to revisit in a much more fundamental um, way the microstructure that we have operating in foreign exchange market now. Um, and last, but by no means least, we have to um, begin to think about making greater uses of official sources of development finances. In the past, because we have such huge revenues coming in from the energy sector, we could basically have forgotten about that. But now we're in a situation where in order to maintain foreign exchange um, levels at, that, at levels that doesn't com compromise economic activity, we need to make much more intensive use of um, official sources of foreign exchange market. And last, but by no means least, um, this attitude that we have that, you know, um, we are earning all this money from the, um, the energy sector and so on, and we don't need um, the, the flows from other sectors is a thing of the past. So the foreign exchange that we could glean, the little that we could glean from agriculture, export agriculture, from manufacturing, from tourism, we have to really pay a lot of attention in terms of how we could, I don't want to use the word scrape up or, or, or target these smaller flows, inflows of foreign exchange but we definitely need to um, start focusing very, very intensively at the level of government and the private sector in terms of exploiting opportunities in these sectors um, that we have neglected over time because we have so much money or so much foreign exchange coming in from the energy sector. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer any question in the question and answer session. Yeah. Dr. Farrell. Yeah, thanks, Raven. Um, So first of all, let me um, endorse, I think, everything that Dave just said um, there. I like his analogy 
of the ball rolling down the hill. I think that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a very analogy because it's precisely the issue. And he talked about, I guess, what we had to confront in 1993. Um, the, 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 I suppose the first one here, the dinosaur among economists. I I understand. I've been out, I'm outdated by my thinking. Um, but in 1993, that's exactly what we confronted. We, we, we realized that you needed to have uh, flexibility in the exchange rate, but you simply couldn't allow the rate to just go willy-nilly from, from daily or weekly to be moving around. And therefore, that's why we elected to have a managed float. So that's point one. The second point is, what are you managing it towards? What, 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 are, you, what are you trying to achieve with, with the rate? And Dave is absolutely right. The exchange rate is a big, blunt instrument. It affects everything in the economy. The price of flour and rice and sugar, everything that is imported, the chairs that we sit on, everything that we consume, that we invest in, has an, a strong element of foreign exchange in it. And therefore, you want to be very careful about not allowing the rate to just go haywire. But what are you managing towards? And Ronald pointed out, that what you want is that you want to have an exchange rate that is competitive. What does that mean? What is this we are trying to get at here? Well, when you have an economy which is dependent on oil and natural gas, which is generating rents going into government, uh, using those rents essentially for consumption, you have a problem when eventually the oil and the gas, that sector becomes weak and it can no longer provide you with the foreign exchange to continue doing what you're doing. It, it gives you a false sense of, of security. The rate, we say overvalued. What does that mean? It means that the rate is too cheap relative to your ability to earn it. And if, if the resource that you have, that is to say your foreign exchange, is a valuable resource, then when you use it, you want to make the best possible use of it. What do I want? What do I mean by that? I mean that I want to take that dollar of foreign exchange, whether it is generated from my oil and my gas, or I borrow it from the international capital markets or from the IDB. I want to invest it. I want to take that money and invest as much of it as possible so that it can generate more foreign exchange going down the road. Because as a small open economy, we have to have the capacity to generate foreign exchange. Therefore, we, we can't calibrate our, our, our lifestyle based on what is happening in respect of oil and natural gas. We have to calibrate our lifestyle on, on, on how we can make agriculture, tourism, uh, provision of health services, all those kinds of things more competitive globally and able to generate foreign exchange. We have to calibrate it based on how can we create an economy that is more innovative, that allows investment to take place that then generates even more foreign exchange. And that's what we mean when we say we need to get an exchange rate that is competitive. The current exchange rate fixed as it is at 679 is clearly uncompetitive. The existence, the manifestation of a black market tells you that. The fact that there is excess demand for foreign exchange at this rate tells you that even though the economy is contracting and demand has come down, you still have a situation of excess demand. But there is a philosophical issue, which I hope we can get to in the, in the, in the Q&A, and that is the extent to which policymakers have any belief or any confidence in using the price mechanism, using changes in prices, to signal to the economic actors, to the population, to the business community, to the consumers that they need to change their behavior. We can lament all we want about the fact that we are consuming so much flour and we're importing all of this flour and we need to buy local and we need to grow more food for agriculture. We could lament about it and ministers can parade around things and go and visit farms and encourage people to produce more for export but why, why don't we not understand the importance and the value of the price mechanism as a way of incentivizing that to happen? There is no ministry official in the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Trade, no permanent secretary 
who could make a decision about what is the best price to do that? The Minister of Finance can't do that. How is it arrived at 679? Nobody knows. The governor of the central bank doesn't know. You have to allow the market to tell you something, to give you information that then allows you to set policy uh, using the price mechanism as best as possible. And we as economists, we know and we understand that the market is imperfect, that price signals can go all right, they can go wrong. And therefore, that is why you need to have an element, as Dave was pointing out, an element of management, an element of control in respect of how we, we, we deal with prices. So let me stop there and we can perhaps deal with these things more in the, in the Q&A. Okay, folks, we have, uh, we have spanned three major themes. Where are we? Um, what are the realities? And then the possible way forward. Um, Certainly, that can be said at this point, but let me turn over now to questions from the audience that we have been garnering over this um, session from the very start. Um, and I'm going to be summarizing the questions in mass um, to try to put it towards the panel here. One of the main concerns, one of the things that out from this panel um, unanimously is the need to have a more competitive exchange rate and that is where we need to start the discussion um, and that has many implications in and of itself incentive structures and and starting other parts of the economy there have been a mass of questions over that uh, on both sides you have been questions of you know should we be doing that uh, should we be having that more competitive rate uh, and then there are others within chat that are raising concerns saying well you know um, we are very concerned that you that uh, that the, what these changes might have you all have discussed these at length here already right but let, let's go back to that issue for a second for the sake of the audience um making the rate more competitive and certainly when we hear that we're talking about a devaluation um in this case here right have there been any experiences in your own research in your own tenure um, of cases where we have pursued something like that uh, and ha has that worked and when we say work you know we have been talking about uh making it more competitive both in terms of managing the current uh stock of foreign exchange that we have but then also there are knock on effects within the economy of stimulating other sectors so those are, are different areas as well has this work we propose you know what is coming out here is that we need to be more competitive how has historically that move towards a more competitive rate has that actually manifested in us being able to stimmy the flow the outflow of foreign exchange consumption. Has that worked in terms of stimulating other areas of the economy anecdotally? Let me turn it over to, to you. Let me, if, I, if I may, I think Re that, Regan? Answer that question is very easy, you know. We did it right here in Trinidad and Tobago. We don't have to go and look anywhere else in the world. We don't have to read IMF reports about it. We did, it, we did precisely that in 1993. We came out of an IMF program, which was from 1986-1987. We considered this matter very carefully. We, went, we, we, we had the exchange rate adjustment. The rate was at 425. We went to 576, and we, we started a managed float from that time. And if you look at the performance of the, the economy of Trinidad and Tobago over the course of the last decade, 50 years, that period between 1995 or 1993 and 2003 is a golden age. The economy performed superbly well. The, 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 this so-called devaluation, and I do not like to use that term, right? Because if you, if you have a fixed exchange rate regime, then you devalue. If you don't have a fixed exchange rate regime and you have a floating regime, then the rate is depreciating. You are managing the float downward. And you're managing based on certain criteria that you have to ensure that the rate does not become overvalued, that it remains competitive. You, you have your fingers on the pulse of the sectors that have the potential to export, your agriculture sector, your manufacturing sector, your tourism sector. The folks in the central bank, and Ronald worked in the central bank with me, we were out there understanding what it is was happening in the business community, what it is they wanted to see, what capital investments they needed to make, 
And today, when we talk about innovation, what innovation needs to take place? And therefore, that then tells you where the rate ought to be. And you manage it because the central bank was in a very happy position, unlike other central banks in the region, where we had foreign exchange available to us coming from the energy sector, paying their, 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 their taxes in US dollars, which gave the central bank the ability to manage the rate. We did it in Trinidad and Tobago successfully for 10 to 15 years. Why can't we do it again? The reason why we didn't do it was because the politician said when they did it, they lost the next election. That's why they, 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 they don't want to do it now. Because they said when we did it in 1993, we lost the election in 1995, and therefore we are not going to be doing that again. That's where we are. Reagan, let me take off from there. It if, should. Yeah, by, by saying to Terry's last point, that really it is why whether we live in a democracy and we have a contest for government, uh, we have a contest, we have elections and so on. And it is a reality, I think, uh, as economists, we, have, we, we must all put on the table that there is, there is uh, elections and governments, those in power don't want to lose that power those who in opposition would like to get in, 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 into office. So, and, and we, we, we live in that, in that system. Uh, the issue then becomes, well, how do we communicate the, the difficult medicine, the bitter medicine that we have to take from time to time? And I think the issue really is one about communication that someone mentioned about there's the fear of having an appropriate exchange rate. So what about the fear about fuel prices being appropriate? What about the fear of water prices being appropriate? Or electricity prices? Uh, while it's a philosophical issue, as Terry alluded to, I think that the politicians are willing to consider price changes, the role of the market, and if we follow what they have been saying in respect of efficiency and, and the international market, competitive prices, subsidies, in respect of those products I mentioned and the changes that are going to take place if they have not already taken place in the case of fuel, then I think there's, there's some kind of an understanding that we cannot continue subsidizing uh, important commodities for including imports forever. We cannot afford to do that. And therefore we have to find ways to communicate with the population why we must do what we are doing. So if you take the exchange rate uh, or foreign exchange, which is our topic here today, and you, 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 you replace what is being said about water. The cheaper the price of water is the more we waste it. It is the less efficient we are in respect of the use of water. Well, the same thing applies to, the, to foreign exchange. So when we lament the, the over expenditure on imported things, it is because it is cheap. When we cannot, incentivize domestic producers in agriculture and elsewhere. It is because the foreign stuff is cheap. And we are making that argument in respect of water. We're letting it run because it is cheap. We're not looking to maximize how we use it because it is cheap. Similarly, electricity, all the lights are on in all the households, in our, all, all our households, because the price of electricity is cheap. It then encourages wastage. It is what we, we allow to happen with the scarce foreign exchange that we have. I'll stop there. Yeah, if I could jump in with my two cents here. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in what the rate is like to be. My students ask me this, businessmen ask me this, people on the, um, who, I, uh, who I play football with ask me this question. Um, and the question, if you ask five different economists, they're going to give you five different answers. 
What I could say is that what is definite is that the rate that we have now is too low. It needs to increase. And if you judge by what the black market rates are in Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Farrell mentioned a rate of between 8 and 850 to 1. So that's probably the lower bound. If you, if you gauge by what the IMF is saying in terms of our overvaluation, um, when it compares the real effective exchange rates, for example, in 2017, I think they, they had it at a 43% overvaluation. So if you do that particular metrics, you get up to close to 10 to 1, right? So my own feeling is that the rate, the effective rate is between these two bands. But to me, the more important thing is how do you get from here to there? Because to me, the most important thing is not what the rate is, is how you get from here to there, right? So I mentioned the whole thing about letting it descend. And I, I like one of the students in the chat say that, you know, in a flexible exchange rate regime, when we're talking about changes, we talk about depreciation. Devaluation is when you open a, a fixed exchange rate regime. But probably we should call it devaluation because um, de facto we are operating a fixed exchange rate regime, right? But the point is how we get from here to there, the period of time we take to get from here to there. And I, it, with the exchange rate, one has to be very careful. Dr. Farrell mentioned the understanding and adapting um, the strategy in the 1993 to um, and the next and the next five years, right? So that is exactly what the the authorities, the central bank has to have its ear on the ground, listening to not only the businessmen but consumers and people who invest in Trinidad and Tobago and, and so on and so forth. So to me, in I during Ewart Williams tenure, I remember the rate moving from 2.33 to 2.45 over the period of almost five years. Nobody recognized really that the rate has moved from 2.33 to 2.45. And to me, that is the most effective thing. You do have this, this, this grand drama about the rate moving from here to there immediately because that is going to do all kinds of damage. That is a recipe for disaster. So we have an idea of what the rate should be. If you don't want to accept the point estimate, accept the ban. And the more important thing is how we get from here to there, and my um, argument would be, you get from here to there very slowly. Understanding all the pressures around and all the, the noise around from businessmen and from other interested parties about where to go and how quickly to go and so on. But the government and the central bank has to be responsible because the, um, you know, as economists, we tend to be very conservative and conservatives for very good reasons because we, we, have, we have witnessed the mistakes in the past and we only have to look to the north in Jamaica and to the south in Guyana to understand how quickly things can unravel. But Dr. Farrell is absolutely correct. We have an advantage in terms um, of the fact that the central bank have a watcher, so to speak, still in terms of a foreign exchange reserve. It came down from 11 billion to 6.8, but that is still considerable. If we add what is in the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, you still have a suitable amount to help manage the process. And what you don't want happening is sudden moves that get people very jumpy, right? You want the rate to descend very slowly and imperceptibly like it did towards the latter period of Edward Williams' um, um, tenure, right? And th that way people, the economic agents in the, in the economy and the society at large has time to adjust, make their own adjustment in terms of how much money they spend on the children, education, in terms of cars that you buy, in terms of all these things, the amount of money you invest in different securities, whether it be US dollar denominated or TT dollar denominated, it allows the economic agents in the country to adjust without the country falling off the face of a cliff, right? So to me, we kind of know what the rate should be, but the more important question is how we get from A to B. That's I me mean, again. Um, let me um, endorse everything that, that, that Dave said. There. I think I think I think I think he's absolutely right. Uh, and, and that's what we sat down and determined back in in, in 1993. That that, that you, you once once you made the big move, you then move it gradually. The market doesn't notice a move of 10 cents over a course of a month. It does, it's, it simply doesn't. And as it moves, people adapt to it. But, but you see, Ronald Ray raised a very important point when he started talking about water. We subsidize water 
We subsidize electricity. We subsidize fuel. We subsidize ferry transportation. We subsidize everything. And why is that happening? Are these subsidies done for any kind of economic purpose or any kind of valid social purpose? Do we continue subsidies long after they, are, they, they have served any, any, any useful purpose? The water rate in Trinidad will last change in 1993. And, and therefore the deterioration that we have in the respect of the supply of water, the distribution of water in the country is a direct reflection of the fact that the Water and Sewage Authority is an under-resourced agency. And the politicians, our policymakers, those who lead us, have got to get to the point where they are going to have to tell people, rather than the IMF coming in and telling that you have to do it, you step up and tell people as, the, as their leaders that this is the cost of fuel. We, we're going to get rid of diesel because it is a polluting fuel and we want to move the country towards the use of renewable energies. And to do that, we will increase the price on fossil fuels. Fossil fuel producing countries all over the world are doing precisely that. The Netherlands is doing it. Scotland is doing it. The countries in the in the in the Arab, the Saudi Arabian countries are doing it. In, 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 are doing it because they understand that the fossil fuels are terminal. But we continue to hold on to this idea that the price of gas is going to rebound. Look at what is happening in our petrochemical sector. Because the cost of natural gas has been going up, producing natural gas has been going up, those, com those companies in the petrochemical sector now find that they are unable to generate, to operate profitably. So what do they do? They close down. That's economics 101. There's no complicated story about that. And they will leave because if they cannot do business profitably in Trinidad and Tobago, they don't love Trinidad and Tobago. They're not here because they love us. BP is not here because they love us or BHP or Shell or ProMan. They're not here because they love us. They're, they're here because they can do business profitably. Unilever is downsizing in Trinidad. Why? Because they can no longer, it doesn't fit the business model to continue to operate in this way in Trinidad and Tobago. And every single one company mm -hmm. out there right? They are experiencing a situation, we are experiencing this year, where the supply of foreign exchange is going to be reducing. Let me jump on from that point. Eh? So we've been talking about managing the foreign exchange availability uh, through having a more competitive, among many other points, but having a more competitive uh, exchange rate. Are we standing where we are and remaining where we are? Are we already affect apart from the issues, the impact on foreign exchange availability, but are we having an impact negatively or positively on economic other areas of economic development? Because this issue of foreign exchange is not just, yes, it is about the foreign exchange availability and the policies, but standing where we are and continuing to stand where we are, are we compromising economic development, um, diversification, all these different things? Dr. Farrell, any member of the panel? No, I, I would say I would say regular, absolutely we are right. And and one thing I've said recently is that the country we have we have we have three I, I call them imperatives. Mm -hmm. The first imperative is adjustment, right? Which is to say that our export earnings have dropped. It's an exogenous shock, and we have to adjust to that. Our real incomes have declined. They declined in November of of, of twenty fifteen when oil prices fell, our incomes fell then, and we have to adjust and adapt our expenditure. That is adjustment. The second imperative that we have is diversification. We cannot continue to run an economy being driven by the, in, the energy sector, by the engine of oil and natural gas, because as I maintain, and I may be wrong, but I maintain that that sector is terminal. We have to think about it as being terminal. In other words, we have to plan for a future for our children and for our grandchildren in which Trinidad and Tobago's economy is not dependent on oil and gas. It is dependent not on one, any one thing, on a whole variety of things it's going to be dependent on. That's the diversification imperative. 
And the third imperative is the transformation imperative, which is to say that in order to make these things happen, we have to engage in a series of institutional reforms, including importantly, how the state, how the government operates. So the government cannot continue operating the wassers and the ports and the T and techs and all of those things and the service commissions, all of those institutions, which quite frankly are collapsing around us. The police service, all of them are collapsing around us. So we need to have transformation of our, of our institutions in the society and make them conform to what, what has to be the fundamental objective of all of this, which is to improve the economic circumstances of the population of Trinidad and Tobago. That should be our, our, our fundamental objective. So those are the three imperatives I've been talking about for the last five or six years. Adjustment, diversification, transformation. I could jump in here. The, um, the whole issue of diversification. Um, sometimes people look at diversification and they, 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 they think of it as such an intractable problem that that doesn't create the confidence that you could go about doing it, right? But I tell people when they tell me those things, I tell them, look at the Eastern Caribbean. The Eastern Caribbean, that's the Grenadas, the Antigas, and so on, St. Lucia's and so on, move from an agricultural-based economy, primarily based on bananas. And in 15 years, the major source of plank of the economy was tourism, in 15 years. So if the Eastern Caribbean could do it, we can do it here because we have a higher capital base, we have a, 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 more, a much more um, 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 skilled population and so on and so forth, right? The, the issue is that we have become so addicted, and I want to use the word addicted, to oil and gas that we cannot think outside of the box anymore, right? So oil and gas will solve all the problem, but as Terence mentioned um, um, previously, Yes, commodity price will go back up eventually, but it will go back up, but on a declining trail because the, 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 very, the reason for being of the petrochemical sector is slowly and slowly declining as we transition to a different type of economy, a green economy and so on. So the problem is one that we have to recognize that is it might take us about 10 to 15 years to, to, to make meaningful progress on diversification. But if you wait until you absolutely have no choice, because that's what people tend to do, eh? It's human nature to, to, to make difficult changes only when we are forced to. But the problem is when we are forced to, we are in such a bad way that the cost, the social cost, et cetera, is going to be very, very high. So we have to be strategic. We have to think now when we still have a lot of resources coming in from the petrochemical seminar is the perfect time to start to transition out of the petrochemical sector, right? And the only, we have to recognize that as a country and irrespective of who forms the government, that has to be the number one priority, right? It is so easy for politicians and, and, and people generally to become so comfortable in this thing that we are an energy-based economy and so on, but that is slowly being a, a, becoming a thing of the past. Some of the biggest petrochemical producers, Saudi Arabia, as Terrence mentioned, they are transitioning to green economy. Every house they're now building, they are putting solar panels on the roofs and so on. You understand? And we, we in Trinidad, we don't have the problem of winter and so on. You know, um, the, out of the, the 360 days that we have for the year or so on, how many days are going to be um, rainy without sun and so on? So again, we have, to, we have to envisage what the future could be and have the, 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 the confidence and the will to say, you know what? Even though we're still making a decent living from, from this sector, if we want to um, secure the future of our, our children, then we need to make the change now. Yeah. Dr. Anderson? Yeah. Uh, I want to remind us that we really, uh, having this, this seminar under the, the Dimas Rampasad seminar series, and it struck me really that Mr. Dimas and Mr. Rampasad had very important tasks assigned to them when they were with us over the, over the last few years. And I think um, it would be useful to see the kinds of recommendations which they would have made. Mind you, they both worked in government. And they, like other people, 
were appointed to, to survey the economy and to make recommendations at times just like what we face now. Uh, in other words, the oil economy up to certain points uh, had run its course. Uh, we were having problems, huge government expenditure, too many subsidies, too many state enterprises, et cetera. And they made certain kinds of recommendations and were very good reports for, for the time. Um, either they were not implemented or implemented partially because the price of oil initially, which was the big thing then, uh, rose again. And these recommendations in respect of state enterprises, et cetera, were put on the shelf. I'm afraid that we are not seeing, I think there's some consensus globally that the price of gas and oil are not likely to go back to what they will. And for all kinds of reasons, Terry mentioned that we are aware of the renewables and so on, and that we may not have the kind of spike for any length of time uh, that, that, that we have had in the past because of global structural changes that have happened. But on the other hand, our lifestyles remain tied to high oil prices, high gas prices, high energy prices. And I'm saying that, and I'm, I'm reminding us of that to say that once again, uh, there has been a team appointed to come up with certain new sectors, new ideas, the creative sectors, uh, creative sectors, steel pan, carnival, domestic tourism, health tourism, et cetera. Issues that require investment, issues that require innovation, issues that require us addressing now. And really in this transition period, we got to take them on board, take them seriously, take the lessons of the past that we, we cannot afford to fail on this occasion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, panelists. Um, we are drawing clo uh, close to the end of this session. Um, certainly much bigger issues and many issues more than we could accommodate within the time, but I hope that we have done justice to our audience today. Um, this is the start of the conversation and um, we are grateful that these panelists have chosen, have accepted to join us, to partner with us in, in bringing some useful information and experiences, their breadth of experiences, uh, to, to share with audience members. We've been talking about the need for a more competitive exchange rate. Um, that is something that's clearly coming out unanimously from the panel. But we, there's also the point that has been underscored over and over again, that it is not simply a matter of, of just a more competitive rate, but you need to manage that carefully. And that needs to go hand in hand with other policies um, uh, carefully managed with other areas within the economy and that is so you know many times we hear about the issue of devaluation i don't like i also don't like to use the term devaluation but let me say a more competitive rate but we uh, it, it must be emphasized on um, what is being emphasized from this panel is that that needs to be carefully managed alongside alongside many other policies if something or when something like that is is being done um let me um in the time that we have, I know that there are many other questions that the audience has asked. We will be continuing these conversations. So these questions are not going to go in vain. They will certainly shape other sessions that we will create from here. And um, for my part, I'm going to, uh, to bid you farewell. I would like to thank the presenters for being here with us. Um, and in the last minute or two that we have, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Conrad, head of the department, um, to say a few words. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience members. It has been a pleasure being with you all. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Conrad? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Regan. Uh, good morning. Good, well, good day, everyone, now. Uh, thank you to the panelists for, for being willing to serve on the panel this morning. And also, thank you to Regan for hosting the uh, program this morning and as well as the planning team, all of the work that went into putting together what I think is a very 
a very good, strong discussion. I mean, I've heard a lot about the issue and read a lot about the issue in the print media, but I have not heard what we've had this morning, which is a group of economists who are academically trained as well as uh, have served as and continue to serve as practitioners. So we have gotten the best of both worlds and not, uh, not, not the political viewpoint. So it's very refreshing to hear this viewpoint. And again, I would like to thank everyone and thank you to the audience for all of your uh, questions. It was very, very engaging, which leads me to believe in, in near future, we may have to have a part two because of the volume of questions that, that have gone before us, um, a number of questions. So once again, thank you everyone. And um, again, the Demas Rampasad series, thank you, Glenn Reagan. And we look forward to a few more during the course of this semester. Thank you everyone.